Hawaii's first mail-in election is in the books. Hear from the state's chief election officer on how the primary went, voter turnout, and lessons to be learned before November. Plus, we'll take a look at the primary winners. Several candidates have already won their seat, but the majority are moving on to the general election to face new opponents. We'll break down all the hot races that still need to be decided. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of election 2020 on Insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. Hawaii's mostly male election shattered previous primary numbers with 406,425 votes cast. That beats the old record of just over 309,000 in 1994, and it's a little over 51% turnout a big improvement for a state known for the lowest turnout in the country. Tonight, we'll take a closer look at the primary and what we can expect for November. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Scott Nago is the state's chief elections officer. Catherine Cruz is a journalist and host of The Conversation at Hawaii Public Radio. Sherry Bracken is a freelance journalist based on Hawaii Island. And Colin Moore is an associate professor of political science and director of the Public Policy Center at UH Manoa. Let's start off talking about the Big Island mayor's race. And I wouldn't usually do go to a, a neighbor island first because, you know, so many people live on Oahu and so on. But what happened on the Big Island deserves our attention. Harry Kim lost his seat, uh, such an iconic figure. Sherry, uh, it was a surprise to us. Was it a surprise to you? Well, at, Colin and I have talked about this after he said the same thing, that he was quite surprised over the weekend many times. I think that people on the Big Island just feel like it's time for Mayor Kim to enjoy his retirement. He's 81 years old, and there's a lot of leadership issues that need to be addressed right now. And as you know, Harry Kim's kuleana was really civil defense. And in the last three and a half years, that's been his focus, but there's a lot of other parts of running this island that need to be attended to. And I think that people felt that just was not happening all around the island. As you can see, he did not win any of the precincts. So it was a universal decision. Uh, Catherine Cruz, I mean, you're familiar with the characters, characters there. What did you yes. think? Well, I think uh, uh, Mitch Roth, you know, really hustled, you know, because nobody was really sure if Harry was going to jump in and uh i think he just worked really hard and got his message out i also think that mitch roth has done a lot of positive things that people gravitated to that totally resonated with people some of his programs to keep people out of the justice system he's not what i would call a traditional prosecutor he focused on looking at kids whose parents were incarcerated so they wouldn't follow in that same path he focused on, as people were coming out of prison or jail, to try to make sure there was a way to get them to be functioning members of society. So that's the kind of thing I think Mitch Roth was focusing on. And then, of course, the sort of surprise second place winner was Ikaika Marzo, who has zero political experience. Uh, Colin Moore, you mentioned uh, earlier in the campaigns when we were talking, it seemed like people were looking for people who were not established politicians this year. That's right. I mean, this this seemed to be the theme throughout the elections th throughout the state, that this was a, a change election. And Akaika Marzo's uh, victory was sort of interesting because, I mean, he had, in retrospect, a key advantage, which was he already had established this huge presence on social media. So first, you have this huge increase in new voters. And I think most of those were younger voters, people who don't tend to vote frequently. But also, if you're campaigning during COVID, you can't do traditional door knocking, sign waving. There was a little bit of that, but it was tough. So Akaika Marzo, already had the ideal infrastructure, a huge social media presence that then he was able to uh, to marshal, I think, uh, to uh, to come in second place. And uh, and in retrospect, I shouldn't have been as surprised as I was on election night. Uh, Catherine and Sherry, both of you, I mean, what are you, what can you tell us about Akai Kamarzo? Uh, I mean, I don't think the average person knows much about him. I don't know enough about him, you know, to, to be confident. And quite honestly, Sherry, that's your your islands. You know more about it. 
Well, I talked to Kaika on Sunday morning after the election, and I think he was a little surprised himself at how well he did. But he told me he's a fisherman, he's a cowboy, he ran a lava tour boat company. So like I said, he doesn't have the traditional experience. And he was involved with creating something called the hub during the lava flow of 2018, when he felt that the county really wasn't meeting the needs of the people. And the hub ended up with a huge cadre of volunteers who helped with food distribution, clothing, a place to sleep, a place to stay. And that's really, I think, how he got to be known. And then once he decided to run for mayor, he traveled all around the island doing Facebook videos and, and talking online. So Colin, like you said, he was very good at social media. But I have to say, I was a little surprised that Stacey Higa, who has a long time political history, did not place a little better than he did. He came in, I believe, fifth. Let me really quickly ask this question. Uh, Sherry strike me as being the only person really qualified to answer this question, so I'll go ahead. We'll find uh, out. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Harry Kim still got a fair number of votes. I mean, he didn't, I mean, he didn't get crushed. Uh, there were a lot of candidates, too, in that race going down the ballot. Did you have 12, as I recall? 15, 15. 15. So there's a lot of votes out there, and I can't imagine two more different candidates than Ikaika Barzo and uh, Mitch Roth. What do you think is going to happen in the general election? Colin, you can weigh in on this, too. Well, I'll, I'll, I can't wait to hear what Colin has to say. I'm actually going to be doing a longer interview with both Ikaika and Mitch within the next couple of weeks. And it really is a look at, at Mitch Roth, who has a long career in being able to run large organizations because he has been the Hawaii County prosecutor for eight years. And he was the deputy prosecutor on Oahu prior to that. Well, he was deputy prosecutor on the Big Island, but before that on Oahu. Ikaika, having really not a business background nor a political background, it, these are like two completely different candidates. And just seeing how they approach what's coming up is going to be interesting because he kind of has got to convince people that he knows how to run an organization with a bigger than $500 million budget with 2,500 employees. And that's not easy. And Mitch has to be able to connect with people in the way that he has shown that he can. Uh, Colin Moore, you know, uh, I, I, I somehow I'm remembering a name from the past. Was it, uh, Bernard Acana, was that the name of the, the guy that came out of nowhere and won the mayor's race? 20 years ago, was it? Years ago. I'm so yeah. the, so the Big Island has a history. It does. I mean, the Big Island might be a little harder to predict than, than Oahu, for example. But I, I, I agree with Sherry that Akaika Marza really has an uphill battle because you can ask, OK, I mean, you just said this, Daryl. Harry Kim got a lot of votes. Where do those votes go? Are those Akaika Marzo voters? I'm not sure. I think they're probably Mitch Roth voters. So it may, you know, he may reach his ceiling pretty quickly. But you know, when you have a candidate like a Kaika Marzo win, it's still beneficial, even if he doesn't win, uh, end up um, winning the mayor's race, you know, he'll still inject a lot of new ideas. I mean, it's, I think it's always refreshing to, to see someone come out of nowhere with a, a totally new perspective, as opposed to the kind of more traditional union endorsed uh, centrist Democratic candidate. So Sherry's right. This is going to be a fun race to watch. I think one thing that's happening, too, is now that you have just two candidates, the voters can focus and get to know a little bit more about somebody they may not know about and maybe learn something, get a new character, get a new perspective on things. Let me shift to Scott Nago. Uh, we have not included you so far in the conversation, Scott, but you know, you're kind of central to what was what many people consider quite a remarkable uh, success story, this election. Um, just start off by telling us what was uh, what was your biggest challenge going into this election and how do you feel you managed it? I think our biggest challenge had to have been um, running the election in time of COVID. Um, a lot of our, our outreach that we would have been doing um, generally getting out the word that we are voting by mail um, really wasn't there. So we had to find other opportunities to do that um, via social media, uh, newspaper ads, uh, radio ads, television ads. So our biggest challenge really was not going sort of like campaigning, not going door to door and letting people know that we, we would be voting by mail. Well, the, what do you think was the reason for the turnout? Do you, you know, you've probably talked to elections officials from other states that are considering this or using it. I mean, is it is it normal for when you move to a mail election to have this big a jump in, in turnout? Well, I mean, when we shift to mail elections for special elections, the, the difference in turnout was really high. 
Uh, we did have that 2003 um, special election that was held by polling place, which turned out was in the teens. And then we had that 2010 congressional special election where it was like 55%. So there's a big difference there. Um, we did know that if you put a ballot in front of every voter and make it as easy and convenient and accessible as possible, that they would vote their ballot. Catherine, what was your uh, perspective in, 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 as a voter as well as a journalist on this, this election? Well, I'm one of, I think, the many people that like to show up at the polls on election day because I like to see my neighbors and I just get a feel for, you know, how things are going with the poll workers. And, of course, uh, you know, that didn't happen in my neighborhood, but I drove down to Honolulu Hale and, and talked to a number of voters. And their biggest concern, uh, they just said they didn't feel comfortable having the signature on the outside of the envelope. A number of people uh, told me that on and, and, uh, and off I, I'm not not on on TV on camera, but when I was uh, recording interviews, uh, and then uh, I'll share that in my neighborhood we had a number of uh, streets where uh, uh, folks came in and actually just went through our um, our mailboxes. You know the street behind really? me. Everybody, yeah, uh, was a wow. little uh, nervous because they were you know breaking into cars and uh, and looking through people's mailboxes. So if you put your ballot in there. You know, what's to say someone can't just, you know, throw it in the bushes and then your vote wouldn't count. So, you know, I made sure I went down to Honolulu Holly and I put it in a box. Daryl, I just want to say that I th think that on our island, it went really, really well. I mean, we had 122,125 registered, which was more than we've had for any recent election. And our turnout was 53.3%. But one of the things that I'm concerned about, the... I, I went and talked to the post office because of all the discussion about mail being slowed down. And one thing the post guy I talked to said was, tell people not to put the ballot in their mailbox to go out if it's within like a week of the election, because with President Trump sadly cutting back the money for the postal service, what's getting cut back is your door-to-door -door delivery. So when I was doing my announcements on KWXX radio, I would say, take it to a ballot drop box if you can, or take it to the post office or take it to one of the voter service centers. And with President Trump just this morning saying that he deliberately is withholding money from the post office in order to stop ballots by mail, to impact votes by mail. I think Scott Nago, you're gonna have to look at maybe more drop boxes or sending out the ballots earlier or making sure people know they need to mail them back way earlier than you would normally say. Scott, go ahead and respond to that, because I think that um, one of the things I did hear from the county side was that they were surprised on the last day how many ballots there were in those uh, drop boxes all over the island. I think there was over 20,000 or something like that. Um, yeah, so there, you, there, there was quite a bit of ballots dropped off on election day. Um, Sherry is right. We, were, we, did, um, we did get the message out that starting Monday, you should take your ballot to a, to a drop box and not put it in the mail because of the, the time it would take to um, to get to the, yeah, it have to be received by the clerk's office at 7 p.m. not full smart. So she is correct. Um, we are looking at other things we can do for this election, such as mailing out the ballots early or opening up more drop boxes. We just have to see what's feasible um, and what we can do to um, counter this um, slowdown in the post office. You know, one thing, though, I, I got to say that the from what, what we understand, I think both Catherine and I talked to the Honolulu clerk's office, is that in the end, only less than a thousand ballots arrived too late to be counted. Um, and to me, that was a remarkable number. I thought it would be tens of thousands arrived too late because people might drop it in the mailbox too late or problems with the post office. You didn't see any problems with the post office this year after all, right, Scott? No, I, but, but we did see a lot of people dropping off their ballots out of at a drop box um, up until 7 p.m. I mean, you, you saw the pictures of people running to the drop boxes to make sure that the ballot was cast. I, you know, I, oh, I was just gonna say, oh, I wanna ahead, take yeah. just one second and congratulate Scott and the, um, the Office of Elections and all the volunteers for running what was basically a flawless all-male voting uh, effort for the very first time. And, and also to appreciate that, I mean, so Daryl, you asked, you know, how much does turnout usually increase when you move to all mail and voting? Well, Hawaii has blown the doors off. Our turnout increased 
over 16 percentage points. That's never happened in any other state in the country, not even close when they moved to mail-in voting. So, I mean, I think there's a lot to be proud of. We have reversed the trend that has been um, going down since the 90s. The last time we had turnout like this was in 1996. So, um, so there's a lot to be proud of, and I think the Office of Elections um, played a role in that. So, congratulations, Scott. I think this was. I think everyone um, uh, should be should be proud of the work you all did. I was also impressed. Oh, Scott. I, sorry, I really interrupt you. You could, yeah. you could, you could, you could take your lot, lot, lot of toys. <laughs> take your. <laughs> but, uh, but I was also impressed by the counties. I mean, I, I thought the counties and you folks worked very well together this year. There was a clear definition, like we knew who to call to ask what question about what in the past, because you had all these precincts being managed by your folks, and then you had the county taking in the absentee ballots and so on. It was a mishmash of jurisdictions on election night. I remember calling up clerks and being, you know, so where's the ballots? They're driving across the Big Island, you know. It was it was insanity, and I found that you know we knew who to call, we knew who to ask, and I thought you did a nice job of sharing the wealth with the counties, who, from what I could tell, all did well too. The counties okay. did do well. Ours did certainly. Big Island. I couldn't be prouder of Pat Nakamoto and her entire team, but I still, you know, we had fifty three point three percent, and like Colin, you said, it was much better. But I'd really like. I'm hoping we get to seventy five percent, eighty percent turnout. Oh, what, you're shaking your head no, that's not gonna happen? It's it's not gonna happen anytime <laughs> soon. I mean, that's up with Minnesota levels. This this is <laughs> remarkable. If we if we maintain this, which I think we will in the general election, that's that's reason enough to celebrate. It'll take a long time to get back to where we were in the 60s. So I I hope this trend continues. I agree, but um this this was unexpected. So I mean I think we should acknowledge um acknowledge that. Well, and I think one of the thing about it is I know on our island, Pat Nakamoto told me that there were only like 1,200 people who voted in person at the voter service centers. We only had two, but only 1,200. And I was thinking more people would go in there, but really most people did return their ballot to the drop boxes or by mail or to the voter service centers already filled out. So it's exactly doing, Scott, what it was intended to do. Okay, enough backslapping here. I got a couple of questions <laughs> from the viewers. Oh. So. <laughs> okay. you know, we don't want Scott to get too comfortable up there. Um, okay, so uh, a good kind of question that kind of goes to the turnout issue is that what's the deal with purging the voters registration list? We received nine ballots, but there's only four voters in our house. I think that was a source of confusion for, confusion for people. I can't even say it. So, um, does that something that needs to be streamlined or worked out, or are you basically stuck with federal law in that respect, Scott? So the, the only way you can remove a voter pursuant to federal law is if uh, a election mailing gets returned. So, for example, this house that got um, ballots for people not there, unless they drop it back in the mail and it gets back to the clerk's office, there's no way we can start the practice of cleaning up the rolls. So a lot of times, you know, those, those election mailings that you get that says you're registered to vote, and this is, um, in the past, it used to be, this is where you go to vote. If you just take those in, throw it away for somebody who's not there, um, we can't initiate the process to remove voters. So we're asking um, everyone that if they receive one of those in error to please um, return it so that we can start the process of removing a voter. And once we do that, from there, a voter has two general elections to actually correct it or re-register it before they're finally removed. So we can't just remove somebody for not voting or not being there. So um, do you have a sense of how inflated our voter registration numbers are with potentially bad addresses or people have moved or people have died? I believe there's a little less than 100,000 of those um, addresses that are not um, active voters. Oh, 100,000 out of about 800,000, right? right? A little less than 800,000 registered voters. So, okay. So, Darryl? It turned out it's actually better than we thought. Go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, no, I, I just was curious, Scott. You know, when I talked to uh, Rex Cadillo over at the uh, city clerk's office, and I was asking about the, the, uh, uh, the boxes and why we don't do, like, drive up, you know, have mm -hmm. the cars just you know, drive up and then uh, have people insert their, their ballots. And he said that they're pretty, they're pretty hard nosed about it because, you know, if you've got a line, you know, worse to say, you know, on Punchbowl Street, you know, 
how far down, where do you cut it off? And, and I'm just kind of curious, you know, what the state's position is on that. You know, what are the conversations that you had about that kind of thing, drive through? The way the law was structured when we moved to mail was the drop boxes were all um, responsibility or the, the determination of drop boxes was um, up to each individual county. Um, they knew what was best for them. Um, they knew how to implement it and they implemented it. Um, the law does state that um, if you are in line at 7 p.m., you, sh you will be allowed to complete and deposit your ballot. And I guess what Rex is trying to say is it's hard to, to um, draw that line with a car if there's a line of cars because of the safety reasons and all, all that. Yeah, we noticed uh, on on election night, uh, we had a couple of, Hawaii News Now, we had a couple of live crews out, one at both of the visitor centers. And it was, it got quite wild. At one point, our, our, our reporter at uh, Honolulu Holly was pointing out that there was a long line of cars and people were jumping out. Here's a voter at the Kapolei, uh, you know, being quite excited about running up there. Kapolei, that wasn't quite as easy to park. There wasn't really a drive up opportunity there. Uh, this guy, I'm, I'm glad he survived getting to the ballot box. But, um, you know, that was a big issue where we were asking, well, how do you control a line of cars, you know? And, um, you know, is that something you, you probably have to I think he just wanted address? to be on TV. <laughs> I don't know. I think they actually wanted to get their votes in. They were serious, right? But, but Scott, is that something that you might have to address in a statute because— you you don't want to be in a situation where one county you can drive up at seven o'clock and be guaranteed getting your ballot in, but another county you can't. No, I think across the board, if you were in line prior to seven p.m. and, and you you started the process to vote, you would be allowed to complete it. There's one thing that was happening too is that when uh, when a late voter was coming up and the box had been closed, but it was like, maybe it's seven or whatever. And the person was in sight of the election officials. I mean, how do you, the, the definition there, it gets a little, it gets a little shady there. And people really seem to care about those last minute ballots. Yeah. So my understanding is there were ballots that were received after 7 PM, but they weren't counted because they did not um, make the deadline. Um, they were just accepted by the clerk's office, but not counted. Colin, how do you think voting might have changed because of this? I mean, how do you think it might have actually affected either, if not the races in this primary, how do you think it's going to change the way people campaign and um, uh, vote in the general election? Sure. So, I mean, I think um, the answer to that question is, is that, yes, it changes uh, campaign strategy, and yes, it changed who voted. So a lot of we don't have exit polls, unfortunately, but from what uh, studies in other states show that when you move to all mail-in voting, you get more, uh, a better representation of the electorate. So who it really helps are uh, particularly younger voters. It boosts their turnout by, you know, sometimes as much as 13, 15 percentage points. Um, also poorer voters, less educated voters, um, that, those are the voters who enter in the electorate um, with all mail-in voting, which means it, it changes who, you know, it changes the results of these races. I mean, I'll give you the example of the, 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 one of the most important legislative races, right? Kim Koko Iwamoto running against the Speaker of the House, Scott Psyche coming very close to beating him. Um, I think a lot of that was due to, to new voters. Um, and it also changes campaign strategy, right? Rather than trying to use all your resources to build up to the election, you know, to make sure your people turn out on election day, it, it's harder to gauge and it's, you know, where, when do you peak? When do you send out those final flyers? And I think there's sort of some folk wisdom that people either turn their ballot in right when it comes. So you wanna, you wanna push out your campaign material the day you know, after the elections office sends out those ballots because people think, okay, I got, got my ballot, I'm gonna turn it in right away. Or you wanna peak again at the very end of the campaign where it's been sitting on your kitchen table for, for a while. And then, oh, you know, here's a flyer for a candidate and I'm, as I'm filling out my ballot. So it does change election strategy too. Catherine Cruz, I know you were speaking with candidates all the way up to and mm -hmm. even after the election. What did they tell you about how it was affecting their? Well, you know, it was interesting. I think I agree with Colin about Kim Koko Iwamoto because, you know, yes, yeah, she, you know, worked her social media. And I know uh, just in the, the in my district, I was getting a lot of uh, texts from uh, candidates, you know, because I got one candidate coming up to my front door. But I think she really marshaled her uh, her network 
And if it's a younger network, uh, you know, she got them out. I mean, who would think she would get that close to a veteran lawmaker? You know, uh, I do, uh, I can share that when I was down there at Honolulu Hale, uh, one woman who I talked to said she made a mistake on her ballot. She changed her mind. And so she wanted to come down and get a fresh oh. ballot and um, mark it up for, you know, who she thought, uh, you know, should get her vote. So, so she changed her mind in the middle of this. It's amazing you can well, change your timing, mind. Go ahead, Sherry. The timing thing is interesting because on our island, the ballots were supposed to come out on X day, but they came out about a week earlier. And some of the candidates were a little, they had planned their, their strategy to, you know, do big mailers on the day the ballots were supposed to be there. And then they came a week early and some people had already voted. So the whole timing thing is different when you have mail-in ballots. And Scott, if you're thinking of mailing out the ballots even earlier for the general election because of potential mail slowdowns for the president, candidates are gonna to have to take that into consideration. Scott, go ahead. Yeah, so we followed the recommendations of the post office on when to drop it in the mail. So they they recommended for neighbor island that we drop it in the mail five days prior um so that's what we did uh, and and the post office does a really good job of making sure that they move ballots um and so they they moved those ballots they delivered it within a day so that's why they came out early um it's just not, something we gotta that's work not a on. criticism scott i i just oh. I, I thought you know it was just interesting that they did get there early they got there fast yeah. and actually most voters i knew were pretty excited because they had a chance then to look at their ballot, think about their ballot, very different from walking in and being presented with a ballot and then having to make a decision if they hadn't thought about it. Colin, uh, it also allows families to sit around the table and um, discuss candidates, pros and cons and all that. Yeah, because uh, Colin Moore, uh, as you know, candidates really want to know when that ballot's arriving at the front door. We've talked about this a lot. It, it affects how a station will time a debate, for example. And um, so how does it affect a candidate? And Scott, if you could follow up after Colin, did you see a pattern? Like, what was the peak of voting? Was it pretty much at the end or was it somewhere in the middle? But go ahead first, Colin. How important is it to politicians to know when the ballots are coming out? Oh, it, it, it's crucial because, I mean, traditionally, your whole election strategy is built around election day. And now we have, you know, multiple election days in theory. But uh, like I was saying before, um, and from talking to candidates, you know, I think the, the, the general wisdom is they want to have a big push for their materials the day people get that ballot and then a big push at the very end when it's been sitting around and uh, and people haven't haven't. Um, haven't cast it yet. But I, I, I wanted to follow up on something Scott said too, because I think this also might be happening, um, which is maybe in our multi-generational households here in Hawaii, when we saw an increase in turnout because older people are sitting there casting their ballot, talking about politics and younger people who live in their house, you know, they're being told, hey, here's your ballot. You need to fill it out, take this seriously. And I hope some of that happened too. Or the other way around, dad, you better vote. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let me uh, go through some uh, voter questions here because we are getting a lot of questions about the voting process, looking ahead to the general election, which is uh, going to be quite a bit more controversial across the country on exactly this issue, the mail-in voting issue. Uh, one person asks, is there a way to not have our signatures on the outside of the ballot? It, you know, I know that our signatures in bank, in the old days, your signature was, was, was money, literally money in the bank. Is, is that not a concern anymore, uh, exposing signatures and addresses on, a, on an envelope, Scott? You know, it's not, the signature by itself is not personal information. You need other um, confirming things. However, if a voter does feel that their signature, um, they don't want their signature on the outside of their envelope, they're more than welcome to drop it off at a place of deposit, or they can even put it in another envelope, um, address it, and send it in. Could you just put it in a Is there a way you could envelope? have a signature on the inside? Um, just the, the, so the signature questions. on the outside is common practice. Um, it would, throughout the nation, um, everybody has it that way. If we were to put it on the inside, it would take more time to cover it and then we, to open it up. Because we do need to confirm your identity with the signature. Um, each signature is compared to make sure that that is the voter. Um, if you were on the inside, it would be opening it up and then confirming it. And it would just take a little longer. Can you? Yeah, that's what the city clerk's office said that, uh, yeah, that no matter how, you know, made 
you uncomfortable to have your signature on there. He says, well, that's pretty much how they do it across the country. And it would take a lot longer, you know, to get those mm -hmm. results. Uh, I was having a conversation with Rex Cadilla and we were talking about the days when we had our social security numbers on our driver's license, right? I mean, those were the days. But yeah, there's that discomfort that people have, you know, having that signature on the outside of the envelope. Okay, another question. Um, how do you know that mail-in ballots are from Hawaii residents? Could there be voter fraud? We talked a little bit about signatures, but how good are they at tying the signatures to the actual voters, Scott? So each um, signature or each envelope that comes in with a signature is compared to the signature on file. Um, it's done through an automated process. If the signatures don't match, then they get kicked out and then they get looked at um, by human eyes. Uh, it's also important to know that if voters don't think their ballot was received by the clerk's office, they can always go. We have a tracking system on our website where they can um, enter their information in and see if their ballot was accepted. The other question that I often get about, about that is, um, how do you know that a signature, like if it's not quite right, you know, how hard do they work to try and figure out if that's the correct signature? What do they do if they have a concern about the signature at the clerk? So right, so right now, so when we, when we went to all mail, the law did change so that if your signature does not match or there is no signature, you will be notified by the clerk's office and you have um, up until five days after the election to actually correct that. And then um, the clerk's office has been notifying voters whose signatures haven't matched. And um, they are, um, voters are actually fixing that right now. Hey, Colin. Uh... I recall that you, um, you actually sent out those cards early on uh, you know, to be able to correct your signature, you know, if you, let's say your, your health isn't good and your signature isn't the same, you know, that, like, like it used to be, that you could send that on. But that was, like, I think, the very first mailing that I recall getting was that signature verification. Yeah, that was earlier in the year so that we, we know that voters' um, signatures, some voter signatures may have evolved over time and changed. So we, it was just allowing the voter to provide a more current signature sample. Hey, Colin, you know, in addition to um, the signatures, there's other disincentives to fraud, like it's a felony. So really, how uh, how extensive do you think fraud might end up being? Um, I know that, uh, you know, supporters of the president are saying mail-in balloting is going to be fraught with fraud. What do you think about that? It is not. There have been many, many studies about mail-in votes and their security, and it's one of the most secure ways to vote. Um, so I think anyone who's worried about that really, really shouldn't be worried. And it sort of makes sense, if you think about it, how difficult it would be to pull off something like this with so many different people, so many different ballots coming in at different times, compared to an older way where you, you could imagine fraud happening, which used to occur and has happened in some big cities on the East Coast, where you know, there are just ballots from a particular precinct that don't make it in. That's almost impossible to do with mail-in voting. The only the only problem there's been with mail-in voting, um, which has been very rare, and, and those cases have been caught and prosecuted, are what's called ballot harvesting, which you can do to some extent legally, um, but people standing over you, making sure you fill out your ballot in a particular way. But, but that is an immensely difficult thing to pull off. So of all the studies, and there have been many, um, there's there's never really been one that shows that there's systematic fraud at all. It's incredibly safe. I mean, the few instances that there have been um, have been caught and prosecuted because it's it's it tends to be relatively easy to to tell. Do you expect? You know, I have a question for Scott. What if we were to have a hurricane during the middle of you know election leading up to the primary when people have their their ballots in the mailbox? I mean, uh, what do you do then? We did have that at Hurricane yeah. Azel. We actually had the Doug we had Hurricane Douglas almost hit us mm -hmm. uh, one week prior to the election. Um, you know, the difference between Ezel and now is with Ezel, we, uh, one of the remedies for a hurricane would have been to actually mail ballots out to voters and declare them a um, all mail polling place. But right now, we vote by mail, so that kind of takes that away. So everybody would have received their ballot in the mail already. Um, it would just be a matter of returning it prior to election day. 
Okay, you know, I, I, I got some more questions about voting, which I think I'll circle back around because we're about halfway through with our show, not even, and we haven't talked at all about some of the big actual contests that we had other than the Big Island. Um, Colin, uh, what do you think was the most interesting thing that happened on, 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 the, the, on the Oahu elections this year? Well, I mean, I don't know if it's the most interesting thing, but it's the most important thing, which is we had two candidates who've never held political office, Rick Blangiardi and Keith Amamiya, took the first and second spot for um, the Honolulu um, mayor's race, beating out some extremely well-known uh, longtime politicians, Mufi Hanneman, who, who didn't do well at all, Colleen Hanabusa, who missed out on that second place um, finish, and Kim Pine, who's a current councilwoman. Um, this, is, this is pretty extraordinary stuff. Um, and, you know, partly, like I said before, it was due to just this incredible um, appetite for change that you saw from voters and all of those new voters coming in. But, but that's a remarkable thing, especially in a state where incumbents usually win. I mean, our politics don't tend to be upended that much by, you know, kind of outsiders, um, you know, with the exception of some legendary characters like Frank Fossey. So, I mean, that, that's probably the most, um, that's the most surprising thing to me. Maybe the most interesting thing that, that will well, um, that gives us an indication of, of what to look for in the future is that, you know, the victory, uh, or not the victory, but the strong challenge from Kim Koka Iwamoto and, and some young progressives like Adrian Tam, like Sonny Ganadin beating out Romy Kachol. I think you're going to begin to see what we've been waiting for for a long time, which is really challenges from the left, young progressives challenging more centrist Democrats. Catherine, what was your perspective on what you saw? Yeah, I, I was actually pretty surprised about that. Uh, and, you know, I know on one hand you hear a lot about, oh, well, you know, the candidates spent a lot of money advertising. And, you know, we saw Rick Blangeretti's ads out, you know, early on and, and just constantly. Uh, and, you know, we'll have to see whose, uh, you know, supporters will go with either candidate, right? Because you've got all the, you've got Kim Pines supporters, you've got um, uh, Colleen's you know, voters and, and movies, you know, so who are they going to, who are they going to uh, endorse for the, for the general? Yeah. And the, I mean, when you think about it, uh, Rick Belgiardi was a, a strong finisher, but he only got 25% of the vote. So there's a lot of votes still remaining out there. Sherry, I want to ask you though, from the perspective of someone on the big Island, you guys get interested in what's going on in Oahu or what, what is it? What, what was your perspective as a reporter even? <laughs> oh no, we just completely ignore you over there. No, of course we're interested in it because you know, as Honolulu goes, that totally affects the Big Island. So, of course, we're interested in that. And, you know, you had 15 mayor candidates as well. So it was interesting looking at that field. And there were some of them that were well known, like Rick Blangiardi and Mufi and Colleen, people who you might have thought would have finished better than they did. But like Colin said, there seems to be a move towards change. And we even saw it on this island in some county council races where we had a couple of challengers who are more progressive perhaps in Puna and in Hamakua Coast, who are in Puna, the incumbent is now gonna be facing a challenger in the general, did not take it, which was, don't know if was, that was expected or not expected. And Hamakua did not have an incumbent. So we're looking at a former council member, Dominic Yigong, being challenged by Heather Kimball, who's way more progressive. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in that one. Colin, I'd be but Yes, curious. we're very interested in Honolulu, okay. <laughs> Daryl, of course. <laughs> we, we love you people. That, glad, I guess I'm glad to hear that. But uh, Colin, <laughs> do you, um, how did the turnout, do you think, affect these races um, in terms of how things felt? Do you think when you talk about liberal progressive candidates doing better in some of these races. Do you think it's a function of more people voting or do you think it's a function of of the just people want new people? I, I think it's both, actually. This is the interesting thing. So it's not it's not the case that only liberal progressives did well. I mean, I don't think anyone would characterize Rick Blangiardi as a liberal progressive, and I'm not sure Keith Amamiya fits that bill either. So, so some certainly did. Um, but I think it was this combination of a, um, uh, a feeling that uh, it was time for change, um, you know, which is just one of these things that can be difficult to predict in politics. I mean, I think a lot of people, including me, weren't sure whether voters were going to go for experience given COVID, given COVID or, or, or want change. Um, so that can be tough to predict. But you know, that would explain some some of these outsiders uh, winning. Um, but that also the turnout, I think, did favor those 
those liberal progressives. Because if you know who turned out, and we don't have exit polls for this race, unfortunately, I wish we did. But if you look at other states, like I was saying before, you know, the, the increase in turnout is really driven by uh, young voters, voters who don't tend to show up most of the time, um, you know, and they tend to favor outsiders. Um, and I think for the younger voters, they tend to be more attracted to young progressives or, you know, maybe not even young progressives, but outspoken progressives like uh, like Kim Koga Iwamoto. Uh, Catherine, I'd like you know, Daryl. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I was going to say that, you know, you and I have been around a while. And when I first got sent down to City Hall, it was uh, Eileen Anderson who took over as mayor uh, and, and forced Mayor Fossey into retirement. And so that was really interesting to watch. And then uh, when Mayor Fossey got back in again, and then I was down there on a regular basis at City Hall, it was fascinating to, to kind of, you know, see that transition. Uh, and then, you know, over the years, uh, I guess I, I get nervous when I see newbies because, you know, there is such a steep learning curve, you know, uh, you know, after Fossey, it was, you know, Harris and he was his managing director and, and, uh, you know, you had, you had Mufi and you had, uh, you know, his managing director was Kirk Caldwell. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, but I, but I worry, cause I saw, you know, Peter Carlisle come in and he ended up, uh, tapping, uh, you know, Doug Chin to be his managing director. I mean, you know, to have a kind of a, I don't know if you call it a machine, but to have a, a line of potential candidates. I mean, that's always difficult is who can you get to serve on your cabinet? Uh, you know, that's going to be qualified. That kind of knows the ins and outs of city hall because, you know, you look like, at someone at, uh, like Mayor Caldwell, you think, you know, he was across the street at the big house. He was the MD. You think that he would have gotten a lot more, uh, I guess, accomplished during his term, but he came up with a lot of, uh, how would you say, resistance from the council members. He also had a really hard time over at the state capitol uh, in the house. You know, th those were his former colleagues. And, you know, if there were grudges and people were holding things against him, I mean, you know, it's no surprise. I think, uh, you know, Sylvia Luke in the house really took him to task on rail and, and some of the, the, the funding. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how, you know, Whoever gets in, if it's Blangerity or Amamiya, you know, how quickly they can get a cabinet together and how well they're going to do, not just with the incoming council members, who you have a couple of, uh, you know, lawmakers, veteran lawmakers that, that have a free ride, basically, uh, in the general. But, yeah, be curious to watch. You bring up an interesting point is that in the past, the most inexperienced candidates that were elected ended up being one term mayors as opposed to the ones that managed to survive the, the, the eight years. Sherry Brackett, I mean, you've got kind of the same situation up there. You mentioned that you were wondering how Ikaika Marzo might fare under that, those circumstances, but also, you know, Mitch Roth is, you know, hasn't been a mayor before, hasn't been a, you know, he's been an administrator. That's correct. And the selection of the cabinet is going to be key because Right now, I'd say that some of the cabinet members under Mayor Kim are not the strongest and things have not been getting done as well as they could have. So whoever Mitch or Ikaika pick, it's really critical, particularly Ikaika, because he doesn't have the background. He doesn't know how government works. So he's going to need people who are extremely adept at understanding the mechanism. You know, um, the other thing that occurs to me is that yours is a nonpartisan race, so is, so is the Oahu race. There was already an election night kind of a, a little bit of a conflict when the Democratic Party chair came on and kind of hinted that, that uh, uh, Keith Amamiya would be the favorite of Democrats in the general election. He didn't say it out loud, but he kind of said, oh, we expect people will be voting their Democratic values. And it looked like um, Rick Blangiardi was feeling a little miffed that, you know, someone was turning this into a partisan race. I mean, is it OK to turn a nonpartisan race into a partisan race? Is there is there anything wrong with that, Colin Moore? Is there there's no rule, but is I mean, it, I was shocked it, myself when I heard that. Why? I, I, I was going to say that it's, it's politics. I think it's to be expected, <laughs> um, especially in a Democratic state like like Hawaii, that identifying yourself as a Democrat is helpful. I mean, think about Charles DeJou, right? He, he did well the first round, um, the, and then the Democrats uh, did it, made every effort to, uh, to advertise that he was a Republican, to talk about his record in Congress, of all things, when he was running for mayor. So, I mean, I, 
I'm not surprised to see this. I, I think that this is this is one of the myths about nonpartisan races is that they're they're nonpartisan. Um, and I think you can keep that up for a certain amount of time. I mean, because because voters don't have this sort of, you know, it, it's not as it's not as easy to connect the partisanship with the candidate, but but they usually get there eventually. Um, so I'm I'm not surprised at all to see this. I mean, it, you know, it, in politics is it's it's like a boxing match. People will take every advantage they can get. And, and if you're the more liberal candidate and you're supported by Democrats, you better believe you're going to identify yourself as a Democrat in Hawaii. Catherine. And Daryl, don't forget about the recall of the city council members. Remember that? Uh, Patsy mm -hmm. Mink led that. Uh, you know, you had uh, Taraki Matsumoto, uh, George Akahani, uh, and Rudy Picaro. Um, oh, gosh. Rudy Picaro. Rudy Picaro, yeah. And, you know, that was a big deal because they switched parties and then, you know, she led the recall and, and, you know, they out of that, recall. we got uh, Donna Kim, <laughs> you know, I mean, we just, a, a lot of, uh, that, that was, oh my, man, I remember those days. That was, that was an, an amazing time. I think we have a partisan state. I mean, and I, so I think that uh, Colin I, I, and, and Catherine and maybe Sherry, how do you run against that if your people, if they manage to stamp the Republican uh, stamp on your forehead, how do you, because um, you must run against that, right? You have to get Democratic votes to win here. Um, I think you do what Blangiardi has been doing, which is to talk about being an independent and run against the party. Um, I mean, you say, I'm, I'm open to everyone. Um, you know, actually in the poll, the Hawaii News Now Civil Beat poll, Blangiardi did reasonably well with Democrats. So um, it's not as if, you know, unlike, unlike Charles DeJoux, who was clearly a Republican and served as a Republican as an elected official, you know, Blangiardi's never held elected office. So, so he can, it's, it's more credible for him to say that he's an independent. But I think the strategy here is to do largely what he's been doing. If you've looked at his press releases and around his campaign to, to argue against partisanship because people, although they're Democrats in Hawaii, people don't love the Hawaii Democratic Party. I mean, one of the problems with Colleen Hanabusa fair or not, is she was, you know, sort of shown to be, you know, the, the standard bearer for the party, even though this was a nonpartisan race, people said, oh, well, Hanabusa is sort of the classic mainstream Hawaii machine Democrat. Um, so I think that's the Blangiardi strategy. And I think you're going to see that. I think I'm not surprised to see that anytime partisanship comes up, uh, the first thing you hear from the Blangiardi campaign is to talk about the virtues of nonpartisanship. Okay, I have got a pile of questions back about the election. So, Scott, I hope you didn't feel neglected during that little stretch because now you're going to really take over. Okay, so do people get notified if their ballot was rejected? Did you have a lot of votes rejected? And, and would people know if it was rejected? So, one of, like I said, one of the ways you, your ballot would be rejected is mainly because of your signature doesn't match or you don't have a signature. Um, you will be notified of that. Um, you will have five days. You'll be notified by the clerk's office and you'll have five days to actually correct that. Um, if you're not sure if your ballot was accepted or not, like I said, you can go onto our website. You could go onto our website to check the status of your ballot. And we're, uh, another question is that were there a lot of ballots that were rejected and had to be recounted? Did, you, um, did we have a problem about that? Um, and people do have the ability to clear up any any problems that might be with their signature or so on. Did, did we have a lot of votes that were affected by that? No, I believe we had a um, little over 2,000 of those statewide. Okay. On our island, I know we had about 600, but and Pat Nakamoto said everyone had been called and some of them chose not to come in, some did. But she said, based on the distribution, she didn't think it would affect the outcome. Another question, uh, what is the process for the voters list when people pass away? And Scott, also on that, um, we were talking earlier about, you know, if someone's no longer in the household, is there any obligation of the other people in the household or the family members to tell the elections division that someone's passed away or no longer lives there? So we do, we do get the death list from the Department of Health, but that is only for people who passed away. Um, in Hawaii, in state, uh, the easiest way to, to remove somebody. So if you do receive a mailer for someone who has in the household who has passed away, it would be simply just to return the mailer, not accept it right, and throw it away as junk mail, but just put it back in the mail so it can get back to um, election officials so they can start the process of removing the voter. 
So, so if, if uh, for example, my son uh, no longer lives here, he voted in the state that he lives in, but we got a mm -hmm. ballot for him. So the, what I would do is put that back in the mailbox and then the mailman would take that back and you would actually remove him from the voter list? Yeah, so the federal law says that that's the only way we can initiate um, a removal from the voter list is a return election mailing, such as ballots or social notification cards. Okay, yes. Yeah, so I have I a question for Scott. I have a question for Scott, Daryl. Um, I just was wondering, did you have a large number of people registering that day on Saturday? Mm. No, but we did see a peak um, in online registration sort of right before the, the registration deadline. Um, but as far as um, election day registration, there, there wasn't a whole lot. I mean, like, like I said, there was only 5,000 people who actually um, voted in person. So if you were going to register um, on election day, you would have to vote in person. So there, 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 wasn't, a, there wasn't very much. You know, here's another kind of interesting question, and I think I have to add a little information to this. What if someone is a first-time voter? How would you compare signatures if someone hasn't voted before? Um, I know you do ask for ID and have, you don't even ask for ID for first time voters, right? It's like, how do you make sure that person who walks in and wants to vote is actually the person that they claim to be if you don't have prior so for, for a first time voter, when they do register to vote, they fill out an affidavit. Uh, they would fill out the application, sign the application. That's their signature. Um, that's the signature we used to compare against. If they're going to register online, they would need a Hawaii driver's license or a Hawaii state ID, and we would get that um, signature from that when they applied for and got their ID or driver's license. You know, I'll throw this out to everyone because I think this is an interesting question to chew on a little bit. I had like four questions here about electronic voting. Um, you know, uh, when will we be able to vote electronically? How about email ballots? And there was another one here, you know, do you, do you think that people are ever going to be comfortable with the idea of being completely online and voting? There was a lot of primaries where they tried to go online and it got it got controversial. Uh, Scott, what's the possibility of down down the years ahead going to all electronic? And uh, what do the other folks on the panel feel about that? So for the overseas, what we do have electronic voting uh, via email for overseas voters, um, the military overseas voters who get their ballot, um, they can request a electronic ballot, which will be emailed to them. Um, they, they'll fill it out. They, they can either print it and mail it back, or they can uh, save it and email it back. It, it's up to the voter, but we do have um, electronic ballots, as well as we have electronic ballots for um, the disability community. So those ballots are accessible. Um, so we do have it now, but the majority of the people do vote on uh, paper ballots. How does that work, the electronic thing? It's basically a, a, an HTML ballot. Um, it's, it's compatible with all devices, reading devices, they would mark it, um, they would either print out their ballot, mail it back, and then it would be duplicated onto a regular ballot, or they would email it back, and um, we would either have to duplicate it onto a regular ballot, or there's a barcode that we can scan that would produce the ballot. Is it is it private? Uh, they would have to waive their secrecy, so uh, they would waive their secrecy of their ballot, so it's not... Um, secret, but it is faster than um, mailing. Anybody else want to weigh in on whether we should do more electronic voting? Does that make anybody nervous? Makes me nervous. I like I like having the ballot in hand and I like going down there to Honolulu Holly and sticking it in the box or marking it up. I think it's inevitable. Eventually, my students always ask this question and they always want to you know, be able to vote on their phone. Uh, <laughs> the trouble is, look, it's the security. Um, there's the thing about paper is you can't manipulate it from somewhere else. It's a whole lot of paper, um, and it's right there. And you can always go back and count those ballots. If it's electronic, there might be a way to hack the system. You, you can't hack eight, you know, hundreds of thousands of pieces of paper. Well, I think the fact that we haven't figured out how to do it privately is a big thing because the privacy of the election, that, that's everything. And we are done. I want to say thanks very much to our panel. Mahalo to all of you at home for joining us tonight, and we thank our guests, Hawaii Chief Elections Officer Scott Nago, journalist Catherine Cruz and Sherry Bracken, and UH political analyst Colin Moore. Next week on Insights, we begin our coverage for the general election. We'll talk with the six candidates running to fill Tulsi Gabbard's seat in Hawaii's second congressional district. Six, yeah, six, believe me. Please join us then. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha.
guys. I don't know if you can still hear me. 